All right. Well, looks like it's 12.01. We've got a majority of folks on. I will go ahead and start things off. Um, good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Maya Swope, and I'm the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator here at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Really excited to have you all joining us this afternoon um, for a great presentation about bears and the Boundary Waters and kind of learning to stay safe, hearing some of Alex's adventure stories as well. Um, I wanted to just start off for anyone who's not familiar with Friends of the Boundary Waters. We have been around for more than 40 years, really committed to protecting the Boundary Waters and the surrounding ecosystem and recognizing that the health of the Boundary Waters is at the intersection of people, of community and of wilderness. And that's really what our mission is, is to bring all of those different categories together, focus our work on people, on community, on wilderness, um, and ultimately on continuing to protect clean water and the boundary waters. Um, so thank you all to you who are our members, our supporters, people that come to events. That really is the life of our organization, of what we do, and keeping this work going. So thank you so much for being here and for your support on that. Um, a few kind of housekeeping notes on Zoom. We will have time for a question and answer period towards the end. Um, so there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can put your questions in there and we will get to as many as we can towards the end. Um, you also might have noticed that there is kind of a subtitle closed captioning feature on. If you wanna turn it off, um, you can click the thing on the bottom of your screen that says CC or maybe says transcripts um, and there should be an option to hide the subtitles if you don't want to see those. Um, if anyone has other technical issues or anything like that throughout, feel free to message me in the chat um, and we can try to sort that out as well. Um, I think that's all of the, the major things to cover. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alex Messenger. Alex is a photographer, an author, Duluth resident um, who has recently written a book about um, his experience getting mauled by a grizzly bear um, and also has written some blog posts and stuff like that for us um, on bear safety and how did it not get attacked by a bear. Um, so he's got some really interesting things to share um, and excited to, to have you join us, Alex. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Maya. Uh, thanks for that great introduction. And thanks to the Friends of the Boundary Waters for hosting this, um, for all the work that you do to support this beautiful space that uh, all of us enjoy so much and that's so special. Um, it's really fun to be here. Thanks to everybody who's joining as well. Um, hopefully uh, you find some nuggets of uh, information in here. It starts getting you thinking about things in a, in a way that will help keep you safe and enjoying uh, the Boundary Waters. Um, so as Maya said, my name is Alex Messenger. Um, you can find me online at alexmessenger.com or on social spaces at a messenger photo. Um, and that's the cover of my book, The 29th Day Surviving a Grizzly Attack. And uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about that experience. Um, which is on a canoe trip a little, little farther north the, than the Boundary Waters, about a thousand miles north of the Canadian border, the U.S. Canadian border, um, in, in which uh, I was attacked by a grizzly bear. So um, we'll talk about that and then talk about uh, some things that you can think about when you're traveling in the Boundary Waters to hopefully avoid your own uh, negative encounter. So to kick things off, I want uh, I want you to envision yourself out in the Boundary Waters. Uh, you've been thinking about this trip for year for for months. You know, throughout the year, uh, you've finally gotten out there, and you're out there with your friends or your family. And it's day three. You've been getting into the swing of things. You feel a lot more comfortable now. Um, and things are just kind of clicking. You just had an amazing meal. Who knew you could eat so well in the Boundary Waters? Um, and you've finally laid down for the night. You're tucked into your sleeping bag. You're hearing the, the peepers and the distant call of loons. And it's just everything's calm. And uh, you're about to fall asleep. And that's when you hear the heavy breaking of branches. And you freeze and you listen through the dark and you're trying to figure out what it is, and then you hear it again. So picture yourself in that moment. I, I, I know that there's probably a lot of you on here who have experienced something like that, 
And hopefully after this talk, you'll feel a bit more calm about the preparations that you've taken to ensure that if that is a bear and it's not a moose, <laughs> that your camp set up right and that you know what to do uh, in that situation um, so that it is uh, less stressful and ultimately safe. So um, I've been going to the Boundary Waters since I was a little kid. Uh, here's me. I'm in the front there. Um, uh, apparently, I've got my little blankie, which is, you know, always important to have what makes you comfortable. Uh, and then my parents and then my sister there. Um, my family, I was really lucky in that my family was taking us out onto these adventurous trips from an early age. Um, you know, really appreciate my mom and dad for uh, being bold and going out there um, and instilling that love of nature and adventure in myself and my sister. Uh, over the years, we went uh, and eventually went on uh, longer Boundary Waters trips and uh, learned from our friends, you know, what we need to do. And then finally, my, my parents suggested um, and, and signed me up for a YMCA Camp Minogen trip. Uh, Minogen's a wilderness trip based camp. Uh, that's off of the Grand Marais side of the Boundary Waters, off of the uh, Gunflint Trail. And that was just a total paradigm shift for me going to Minogen. Um, they just, uh, they taught me how to travel well. I learned skills that I never knew I'd, I'd need. And I, I learned uh, what I was capable of on these trips and and just really accelerated my learning. And I kept going back to Minogen and, and eventually started getting um, invited back on longer trips until finally this pinnacle trip, um, which the 29th day is about, which is the Alms de Nord trip, which is a 42 day whitewater canoe trip in Northern Canada. So this is that group. There's six of us. I'm on the left there on uh, the yellow life jacket and our trip like i said was very far north uh it started with a bush flight up into the northwest territories and then it involved 600 miles of canoeing the dubois the kunwak and the kazan rivers to finally end at baker lake my trip ended up being a little bit shorter than the rest of the group um as uh 29 days into that that trip i uh had this bear encounter and we knew we were going to be in grizzly country and we talked a lot about preparations for that and everything but uh the the density of grizzlies up there is really uh dispersed they're barren ground grizzlies it's you're very lucky if you end up seeing one so i ended up being incredibly lucky times a couple times <laughs> so this was the top of the ridge where this happened it was on a layover day you can see we're far north of the tree line there's no trees even on that far shore there as far as you can see here and so the visibility is just amazing except for what's on the other side of this ridge so i was walking up here just ready by myself ready to think about the day and take pictures and and read and uh things like that and i didn't realize it but there was a 600 pound barren ground grizzly bear walking up the other side of this ridge and we were walking straight towards each other we met uh, face to face 30 feet apart at the top of this ridge which is a terrible way to start a bear encounter at that distance the bear has to decide in a split second essentially what it's going to do if it's going to run or if it's going to fight unfortunately in my case this grizzly decided to fight it started with stationary bluff charges and ended up doing a full speed charge i thought through all the all the steps that we were told of what to do when you see a grizzly bear uh, including don't run, whatever you do, don't run. And that's true for black bears as well. And uh, I did what we were told to do. I thought of the bear spray that I did not have on my person, which is something that I definitely advocate for now. I thought about that bear spray and thought about deploying it. Um, but again, I didn't have it. Bear ended up charging at me. Uh, I dodged it a number of times before it finally got too close for me to dodge. And it uh, smacked me across the face with its paw and threw me to the ground. And it bit me in the top of my right thigh. And uh, I blacked out from the pain of that bite, which was excruciating. And I, at, as this escalated, I just became more and more sure that I was about to die. Uh, and then the lights going off uh, was just a very, a very dark uh, moment for me in, in a lot of ways. But I didn't die. I regained consciousness, saw that the bear was still there in the process of leaving, but checking to see if I was still a threat or if it could continue leaving. So I played dead until the bear was gone. And then it was up to 
me to get back to camp uh, to the rest of the group and then uh, up to the rest of uh, everybody to figure out what to do next and and then uh, do that uh, that evacuation. Um, we ran into the hard facts that a helicopter wasn't available, so we ended up um, having to begin with a self-rescue to get towards Baker Lake, that tiny town at the end of our route. I've chronicled that in uh, the 29th day, which um, is a, a, a trip, a book about the trip and the bear attack and everything that happened after that. But uh, we ended up with some challenges that we'd never expected, and it was um, an epic trip in a lot of ways. So. Uh, more details on that in the book, but let's jump into the Boundary Waters. So, like I said, we all love to travel in the Boundary Waters. Um, there are bears in the Boundary Waters, so it's definitely something you have to be thinking about whenever you're traveling there and just taking the proper precautions and knowing what to do um, if you do encounter one. So in the Boundary Waters, we're lucky that we've got the American black bear. We don't have some of the more aggressive varieties like grizzly bears or polar bears. Um, they're typically 90 to 550 pounds. That's certainly not a small animal and they're incredibly powerful. They can flip huge stones um, and they're, they're just a very dense, uh, speedy animal with with tons of power but luckily for us they're uh, less aggressive and they typically avoid humans and if you do have an encounter they're a lot more likely to run away than to do anything else and aggressive encounters with humans are very rare and um, like it says in the slide rarely lead to serious injury Still, there's, uh, you know, things that we can do to help decrease the instance of those aggressive or negative encounters. Um, and a lot of that's related to food storage, which we'll spend a lot of time on today. So uh, we'll get into how I like to break out uh, the ways to be prepared. But one of the key things to think about is to assume that a bear is always nearby when you're in the boundary waters. Now, I don't want you to be Baranoid, but do be aware of their presence. Be aware that they could be uh, around regardless of where you're camped, whether you're on an island or on shore. If you could get there, the bears can get there. They're super strong swimmers. They're great climbers. Um, and like I said, they're super powerful. So just assume wherever you are, there could be a bear somewhere and conduct yourself appropriately uh, so that you don't have... <laughs> A run in um, and then so that you don't have a, a negative um, so they don't find food or or uh, associate humans with food so uh, like I said they can get pretty much anywhere you know more to the point uh, that bear attack that I experienced was on an island on a 25 mile wide lake with miles between the island and shore so um, definitely something to just consider wherever you are so I like to think about bear preparedness uh, and safety in three different ways. Avoid, diffuse, and defend. So first of all, you want to avoid an encounter. You want to avoid surprising them um, and then avoid uh, any issues with your food storage or things like that if they do come around. Diffuse an encounter. Uh, if you do run into a bear, what do you do to you know, get yourself separated from the bear and you know, convince the bear to, uh, to leave? And then defend, what do you do when it's too close for comfort, when that bear um, is dead set on whatever it's doing, um, what to do in that situation. So under avoid, uh, this is the most important category in my opinion. If you, take all the, if you take all these steps to avoid the encounter, to prepare yourself and your group and your camp properly, um, the likelihood of, of having an encounter and especially a negative counter drops a lot. So the, one of the biggest things is to avoid attracting the bear with smells. That's your food, your uh, toiletries, anything that has any sort of scent. And they're, they're a lot like dogs in that they're going to be able to smell things a lot more than you are as a human. Their nose is a lot more developed. So uh, if you smell anything at all, it will absolutely smell it and from a long distance off. So uh, there's a, uh, a saying that a fed bear is a dead bear. Um, and that's one of the reasons that it's really important to ensure that they don't get food from humans and don't associate humans with food. Basically, if a bear starts to do that, 
um, they're going to associate people with food. They're going to come back. They're going to have more interactions with people and they're going to get more accustomed to people and be a lot more likely to be um, aggressive or, or um, pushy in getting their food. Uh, and then they be can become a problem bear uh, and they might end up being um, destroyed by authorities or killed in an encounter. And none of us want that. Bears are really cool and a negative encounter is not a good thing. <laughs> uh, if, if you read my book, you'll see, you know, one example of that. So ensure that the bears can't get at your tasty treats. So pack your gear properly. And we'll talk about both of these. Pack your gear properly and prep camp properly so that uh ideally they don't split and then secondarily if they if they do realize that there's something um, they're not able to get it and then uh, conduct yourself to avoid surprises um what you want to avoid is just something like like my situation where you suddenly you're right next to each other and there is a lot narrower margin of error and there's a lot narrower time that the bear can decide what to do and and that you can decide what to do so um typically what i do for that is if there's you know sharp curves or blind corners or blind ridges or something um making yourself known in some way as opposed to sneaking around which is hard in a, a quiet wilderness area like the boundary waters um but it will help a little bit if you're a known presence as you're going around. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the first step to avoiding though, is to ask the local experts. Boundary Waters is great uh, for so many reasons, but one of the reasons is that it's, uh, it requires permits. So you have to go through an issuing station before you can get into the Boundary Waters. So that means that you have a built-in opportunity to ask someone hey, what's going on in the area that we're traveling in? Are there problem bears? You can ask about fishing uh, ideas or best campsites and stuff too. But just tag on to that conversation. Are there any bears that I need to be aware of? Any regulations uh, that we need to consider? They should be covering that um, on their own, uh, but it's always good to ask. Some areas of the Boundary Waters will have specific regulations or requirements for how you store food. Um, for instance, last year, I think Seagull Lake, and there was another area where there were problem bears and people had to carry uh, bear proof food in, their bear, in a bear proof container. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about more specific storage in a couple slides. But yeah, ask about bear activity, other safety concerns, uh, Weather is a great thing to ask about or fire activity. So just add bears into that conversation. Um, they're the experts. They know this area really well and uh, they're incredible resources. So definitely use them. So for carrying your food, um, you want to pack your food in odor proof containers. Now you see in this photo, we've got a, a great camp cook's kitchen from Frost River. That's not odor proof, but the stuff that you put in there can be. So OPSAC's a great smaller container. There's a lot of different options that you can use for um, carrying your food in a way that the bears won't be able to smell it. Um, a lot of times you can put a bunch of smaller containers uh, that are odor proof into one, you know, standard dry bag or something. So think about that. That's like the most important step you can take. That's pretty easy to prevent bears from uh, realizing that there's food around. Um, consider some bear proof or resistant containers. Like in the regulations I was just talking about, there, there are barrels that you can get that are um, designed a lot for grizzly country. Um, there's other ones as well, bear vaults and things like that, that are harder for bears to get into. Um, and some other specialized as well, specialized ones as well. The other thing is to separate food from sleeping gear and clothes. So you can either carry everything in a, in a completely separate pack, a food pack, or again, use quality odor proof uh, barriers to separate your stuff. Um, but what you don't want is you don't want your sleeping gear and your sleeping area to uh, smell like food. Uh, the other aspect of that is cooking and sleeping separately. In grizzly country, you've got to be like 100 yards uh, between your tent, your sleeping area, and your food storage. In the Boundary Waters, it's a little bit less um, stringent, but definitely do have that separation. You want to cook away from where your tents are and where you're sleeping, 
uh, don't bring scented items into your tent. This includes food, of course, but also things that you wouldn't necessarily think about, like lip balm, toothpaste, snacks, uh, deodorant. I don't worry about deodorant, just leave it at home. So that takes care of that. But every time I'm, I'm doing my toothbrushing, I put that back in the food pack um, for when we hoist it. I'll cover a couple of different options for storage uh, besides the bear hang. In general, keep a clean campsite too. Um, don't have food all over the place. Um, try to keep everything centralized. If you're using it, have it out. And if you're not using it, put it away with your proper food storage. This also helps with all the critters that are, are going to be around the campsite anyway, like squirrels and, and uh, chipmunks and such. So uh, doing that will help you in a couple areas. And then uh, leave no trace guidelines are there to protect the wilderness and to protect you. So dishwashing and fish cleaning should be done 200 feet from your campsite, excuse me, and from shore. So again, that's just separating your different spaces and ensuring that the smells are not going to be associated with the campsite as much. So yes, keep a clean, keep a clean camp. So storing your food. I talked a little bit about the bear hang. That's my preferred, my preferred way of uh, having our food properly stored so that bears can't get to it. That's where you're hanging it up in a tree, uh, in a food uh, pack or any portage pack or in a barrel or dry bag or other odor-proof container. Um, <laughs> it's pretty challenging to do a proper bear hang, uh, which is 12 feet off the ground, 6 feet from the tree, and 4 feet from suspending branches or ropes. Basically, you don't want them to be able to reach it however they get up on the tree. And they're, they're excellent climbers. They'll climb right up that tree. And, and some of them are pretty small, so a stout branch might not break when they go out on it. So whichever way you just decide to store your food, pick the one that works for you and then just do it right and do it consistently all the time. So like I said, we prefer a bear hang. And when that's combined with the odor-proof stuff, that works really well. Um, the other options include like bear proof containers like the bear barrels that I talked about. Um, Ursac, which is actually one word, I, I accidentally split it up there, but Ursac, uh, which is a Kevlar bag that's designed to be bear proof if it's shut properly, paired with an odor proof bag, uh, works really well and doesn't necessarily have to be hung up. On, and it's a nice option for uh, not taking up a ton of space or uh, a ton of weight. They're pretty compact. So, there are other options, uh, but basically you want it to be something that the bears can't smell. You want it to be out of reach or inaccessible uh, if they do get to it. So if you're able to do that, then um, if a bear does come by, they're more likely to either not notice it or um, lose interest when they're not able to access it. So this photo of Amy Freeman here shows a great option, which is a, an odor-proof barrel. You put that in a bear hang, um, that's a great option. But again, if it's odor-proof, they're not likely to find it as much anyway. So, all right, so that's avoiding. So let's move on to diffuse. So how do you de-escalate in distance if you do have a bear encounter? So first of all, not all encounters are negative. There's a lot of times when you can see a bear in the woods and it's just a really cool experience. Um, so I hope that's the kind of experience that you have. If it's too close for comfort, remember, don't run away. That's the consistent thing between uh, grizzlies and black bears. So <clears throat> uh, one of the most important things uh, if you do have a... <laughs> A close encounter is a deterrent. Um, it's not required in the boundary waters. Again, it's kind of up to your comfort level. What's going to make you feel comfortable? For me, when I first went into the boundary waters after my bear attack, I needed a lot of different uh, kind of um, comfort blankets uh, to make myself able to, to conduct uh, myself in the woods and not feel completely on edge all the time. So I was carrying bear spray and a machete and all kinds of things that I wouldn't suggest carrying. Um, but anyway, here's a good example of, of bear spray. And when you're traveling in grizzly or polar bear country, you always have to carry a deterrent. It always has to be on your person and always has to, be, has to be ready. With my story as an example, we had bear spray on the trip and it does no good whatsoever if it's not with each group of people and it's not uh, immediately deployable. So odds are you're going to 
get caught on the way to the bathroom or something when you don't have it. Bear spray is a great option. It's super easy to use and uh, works very effectively. Firearms, another option that people choose. Um, it does require lots of training. Um, and then I like to say it has the unfortunate outcome of um, killing the bear if uh, another deterrent might have worked. Uh, but some people do prefer that. And then other items um, kind of for a little bit further distance would be like noisemakers, like an air horn, um, bear poppers, which are uh, they shoot a little noise making kind of firework thing, um, bear bells. And then yourself. Like I was saying earlier, when you're traveling around corners and things like that, clapping, making a lot of noise um, and just making it so that you're not, you know, ninja hiking uh, in these blind corners. But a lot of that's focused on grizzly and polar country. Um, it's applicable to the boundary waters, but I think a lot of times um, you don't need that level when you're there. Um, but if you do need something, uh, the bear spray would be my suggestion. So um, special circumstances when you do have a bear encounter, uh, anytime you run into one of these, it's a little bit, uh, a little, you have to be extra cautious. Um, so a mother with cubs is a, a scary situation. They're very defensive of their young. So give any sow and cubs plenty of space. Don't ever come between a mother and her cubs. Um, and if you see cubs alone, assume that mom is nearby. So if you see a mother with cubs, just uh, again, don't run, but back away and just give her the right of way um, and separate yourself. If the bear is trapped, uh, that's a situation where it might react differently. Also, if the bear is ill, malnourished, or sees people as a food source, problem bears, um, that's a situation where the bear is going to act a little bit differently as well. It's more likely to hang around you or your camp. It might have a sickly appearance like patchy fur, thin or bony, or an obvious deformity, or just kind of act funny. Like pay attention to your spidey senses um, with that. So uh, problem bears, like I mentioned in the previous slide, are bears who have grown accustomed to humans. They see humans as a food source. They've been habituated to getting food from people either from handouts, like you see on some roadside stops or different places in, in parks um, or in the boundary waters, if they're used to getting food from the bear hang or, or uh, things like that, they'll, they can become problem bears, which is, um, which is a, a rough situation. So additional precautions may be recommended in, the, in that situation. Um, like I was talking about earlier with the rangers, check with your forest service or outfitter um, or permit issuing station before you go out to find out if you're gonna be in an area with problem bears, whether it's something to just keep an eye on or if you have to do anything completely differently. Um, you might end up having to use bear-proof containers or follow other requirements. Yeah, in 2020, some of the areas uh, were Seagull Lake and Alpine Lake where this was an issue. So uh, bear in camp, uh, this is a situation where you need to be ready to respond and know what to do. And if you think about what you're gonna do before this happens, you're a lot more likely to follow through on that and take the steps that you need to take. So uh, when you're coming into camp, you might see signs that there is a bear that's habituating this area. Or if you're on a, a portage or anything, Pay attention if you're seeing bear scat or a lot of bear scrapings on trees or bear claw marks or, or things like that. Um, if you do see a lot of that, you know, consider moving on, going to another campsite. There was a trip I went on a couple of years ago where we were on Knife Lake and we pulled up and someone had scrawled in the sand at the landing like bears, danger. And there was a stack of, of carved wooden spears and the birch tree where th that looks like a perfect bear hang was just covered in bear claw marks going all the way up. So needless to say, we uh, decided to find a different spot. So pay attention to the stuff like that. But if you do have a bear that comes into camp, um, first of all, don't, don't freak out. <laughs> um, think about what you have to do next. So if you do have a deterrent like bear spray, prepare it, just have it handy. Again, you should, if you're using it, you should have it around. Uh, but you want to scare the bear away. With the black bear, um, you want to get your group together, make noise, yell, sing, swing your arms, bang pots together. 
you want to show the bear that you are big and that you're in charge and that this is your area so it should leave most of the time they'll run off um, again if they're habituated or or um, or a problem bear then they might come in and see what what's available hopefully you have your stuff uh, up in the tree or or in your uh, bear proof container things like that another um couple of things you can throw objects at the bear if it's not getting it again you want to keep that like don't don't approach it to do that but if it's getting that close um, that will sometimes uh, get it to turn tail and then again consider leaving the site um, if you need to you know distance is uh, a great option with any bear encounter things get more dicey as you get closer so show it that uh your boss and uh get your group together and um, make a bunch of noise and a big show yourselves so defend uh this is hopefully a situation you're never going to encounter but if you do have one that's way too close um remember don't run no matter what kind of bear it is don't run away again prepare your deterrent if you do have one give the animal as much space as you can uh, like i said they're great climbers so do not climb a tree make lots of noise make yourself big by waving your arms your clothing again getting your group together have your group kind of close together so you look like one huge mass um, and try to scare it away don't make yourself small by crouching or kneeling um, and if it does attack fight back with everything that you've got um, use whatever tools are at hand and um, just uh, give it all that you've got and again i hope that that uh, you never get to that point because if you do all your preparation and you are avoiding it in the first place, you're a lot less likely to have one of these encounters with a bear. And again, if you do come upon them, they're a lot more likely to turn tail and run away. So remember, bears are more scared of you than you are of them. They're out in the wild, living their life, and they typically want to avoid people. Do whatever you can to prevent them from uh, smelling and finding food at your site. And then if they do get there, make it so that they can't get that food. So leave fair at home, replace it with preparation and vigilance. Have that method that you prefer and stick to it. Have that, that practice that you do every night where you brush your teeth, put your stuff in the, in the pack and hoist it or put it in your proof, bear proof container. Don't bring any food into your tent, uh, things like that. So do all the things that you can and then enjoy the woods so when you're in the back country whether it's the boundary waters or anywhere else own it own your own uh fate out there by being prepared and bringing with you uh, all those practices and skills and the tools that you need um, and then enjoy the wilderness there's so much that you can't control so control what you can and then um, and then you can enjoy the rest so that was a very uh high level basic uh, bear safety in the boundary waters um, again i'm alex messenger uh, my book the 29th day is out in paperback hardcover audiobook if you're interested in that you can get it wherever books are sold and hear a bit more about my bear experience and uh, you can also find it at uh, my website which is alexmessenger.com um, or you can reach out to me with that a messenger photo uh, if you have any Thing that you want to cover that's not in this talk um, or have questions about anything else but at this point we're going to switch to question session and uh, discuss what's on your mind any follow-ups from that great well thank you alex that was great super helpful exciting um, to hear your story but then also feel some reassurance about uh preparation options and things like that awesome. um I'll just remind everybody to put any questions into the Q&A and um, as we go, I will try to get um, to as many of those as we possibly can. Um, I, well, somebody had emailed me a question um, asking about the recommendation to play dead and clarifying that that's kind of for grizzlies and not black bears and if that's really true, um, kind of wanting your input on that. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, playing dead is um, more for grizzlies and, and uh, less for black bears. With black bears, you basically want to make yourself big and, and make a big show of yourself. And then with grizzlies, you want to give ground to that bear. 
um and uh and not make a big show of yourself so yeah playing dead is is a great uh way to do that if it's super close um a lot of times what the barrel do is come up and kind of sniff you and see if it like what's going on and, and then it'll leave you um so it's something that i didn't do but it's something that i i could have done uh, in that situation uh, and that would have been uh, one of the right things to do so with black bears go big <laughs> <laughs> great that's helpful yes um kind of along those lines um robert in the q a is asking if you encounter a bear does averting your gaze help or does that do anything um in the encounter yeah, again, that's probably a, a more of a grizzly thing. Um, you know, eye contact is seen as like a, a show of dominance. And so a lot of times when you're <laughs> the non-dominant person or individual, like with a grizzly encounter, you want to show that you're like deferring to that animal. So you want to avoid eye contact um, and again, give it space. But with a black bear, you want to be in charge. So eye contact uh, would be would be fine. Um you know, with like a mother and cubs, again, I just give it as much space as possible. So in that situation, I might um, defer to her. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see. Some people are kind of were wondering more about the odor proof bags. If you could talk more about like what those are, what's a good one? And then somebody wondering, are Ziploc bags or the equivalent, um, you know, if you're double bagging things, is that effective? Yeah, so with Ziplocs, I mean, they're not odor-proof. Um, they may have some specialized ones that would work for that. Um, the more layers that you have, you know, the better. But a true odor-proof thing will be labeled as such. So um, I mentioned one called OPSAC, O-P-S-A-K. Um, they make two versions, one's odor-proof and one's not. That's a great option. And then larger containers like that blue barrel that we saw, um, those are also... Uh, I believe, odor-proof. So you want a thick plastic barrier that's going to contain the scent. Um, but yeah, if you look for odor-proof, that, that's a, a good way to find it because usually they're, they're labeled as such. If you, again, if you have a bunch of layers, um, that'll help. Uh, but if you do have something that's truly odor-proof, then you don't need extra layers. <laughs> and I didn't mention it, but like garbage like any refuse uh, should go in your food pack and should be stored just as well as anything that you're going to eat. Um, so that should also go in that container. Great, thank you, yeah. Um, somebody in the comments was wondering um, if a bear is already in your food, maybe it got your pack down from the hang, would you confront it, try to save your food or just try to distance yourself? What would be your strategy there? Yeah, I would, I would try to scare it off um, and then uh, respond accordingly. So if you try to scare it off and it's just not listening and, um, you know, depending on the size of your group too, if there's several of you, um, you know, you can try a little bit harder. If it's one of you, then uh, you know, use your judgment in that situation, but, but try to scare it off. Um, if it's, if it's then being aggressive to you, um, you know, you don't want to get injured to try to save your food. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but see if you can get it to go away first. Okay, great. Um, and sort of a related question is like, if the encounter is in the middle of the night and you're inside of your tent, should you mm -hmm. get out? Should you stay in your tent? What would that look like? Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, you can start the fireworks uh, while you're still in your tent. <laughs> a lot of times they'll be like, oh, I didn't know you were there and run away. Um, but I'll, I'd get out of the tent. You know, partially I want to know where they are. Um, again, you might want to take a peek before you just jump out because if you jump out and it's right there, that's <laughs> uh, a little bit scary. But um, yeah, I'd get out of the tent and start making that noise. And again, get your group together and get everybody to partake in the in the uh, attempt to attempt to rebuff the the bear. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see. Just scrolling through some other questions. Um, somebody was wondering about hiking with dogs, especially um, either leashed dogs or unleashed. What your advice would be there um, of how to manage a bear in the proximity. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, you know, full disclosure, I have a dog, but I have not camped with that dog. He's very tiny. Um, <laughs> so I haven't looked into exactly how to handle uh, with, a, with a canine, but typically that dog is going to be aware of that bear's presence long before uh, you are. And it's going to bark or, or try to get the bear to go away. Um, so I would guess that you'd be less likely to have an encounter um, in the first place, but uh, I, I won't speak to more specifics because it's just a little bit outside of my scope. <laughs> Good question though. Um, we've got a few people with more questions about bear hangs. Um, what well, somebody is wondering like if you um, have a good spot and you can do a bear hang, do you still need the odor proof bags or is like a regular dry bag okay? Yeah, I mean, do what works for you. Um, you know, like I was saying, if you can layer it all up um, and then wrap it real tight in a, in, a, uh, in a good dry bag, if it's, you know, some of the thinner ones um, that might uh, leach through a bit more. But if you do your best to make it so that the odor isn't getting out and then again make it so that the bear can't get to it, um, that's a really good way to conduct yourself. So yeah, with a bear hang, I mean, it's it's super hard to get a, a bear hang in the right spot. So just get good at it and, and, um, and do the best that you can. Um, and then be aware if you do, you know, hear something, um, try to scare it away so that it doesn't end up getting your food. Um, somebody was wondering if, um, asking, could air horns startle the bear enough to lead them to attack? That's a good question. I don't believe that it would startle them to attack. I think it'd be more likely to get them to leave. Um, an air horn is, um, something that you'd use at a little bit greater distance, typically, um, you know, with that middle of the night situation um, that we covered, that might be a type of closer situation where you'd use something like an air horn. But a lot of times it's more like if it's coming close or whatever, um, you can use those larger noisemakers to kind of uh, overtly display your presence and, and hopefully get it to decide to go the other direction. But I would use an air horn in a close encounter for sure. Okay, great. Um... Or any other, you know, clapping, pans, yelling. <laughs> yeah. Again, making a big show of yourself and your group. Great. Um, I've seen a few people asking, and I know I got an email about this as well, um, with more kind of people in close proximity to the wilderness, whether that's more folks in the boundary waters or whether that's, you know, logging and, you know, more development in rural areas. Um, are there more bear attacks or more problem bears? Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you maybe know those stats, but I would love to see your take on that. Yeah, I don't, I don't have specific statistics to quote, um, but basically anytime that you've got, you know, more people in close proximity to, to bears, there's more run-ins. Um, so there's more potential for there to be negative run-ins. Um, the problem usually comes from that, uh, habituation or associating people with food. Um, it becomes a real problem if the bears uh, associate people with food, get food from them, and it becomes part of their regular food source. If that food source is taken away or they're you know, having a lean year where people are doing a really good job of putting their stuff up uh, and, and the bears aren't able to access it, that can drive them to try to find food sources in other ways and um, to have more of those encounters. So like, for instance, there's examples of, um, you know, uh, dumps where bears are getting a bunch of food being closed down and then there's an increase in negative bear encounters in the area. So the best thing we can do is, is make sure that we're storing our food properly and then not having it be stored in such a way that the bears can't access it. Um, and I think anytime you have a lot more people coming to, for instance, the Boundary Waters, and if they don't have as much experience with uh, the area or, or maybe they aren't employing, you know, the best practices, um, then it's more possible that uh, bears are getting into more food packs and things like that. So, yeah, <laughs> long way around to that, but yeah. <laughs> sure. 
And I think that really underscores the point of when you get your permit or when you're headed out from the outfit are really checking in about the area, especially for folks that are maybe newer to camping in the Boundary Waters. Um, make sure right. you're, you're up to date on all of that. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the past year, so many more people have gotten outside, which is great. Um, but with an area like the Boundary Waters and, you know, a lot of places, you do have to do things in a certain way to ensure that you're being safe, that you're, um, you know, being good stewards of the place so that the next group can enjoy it with as much, you know, undisturbed nature as, as when you were there. And then, um, you know, <laughs> doing things in a way so that the bears aren't, uh, aren't getting into the treats and especially aren't being fed by people. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, a question that I've kind of been wondering, which I'm not sure how much experience you have with this, but in the winter, um, if you're up in the boundary waters, if you can afford to be a little bit more relaxed with some of these spare protocols, or if you would recommend kind of just going fully with all of this regardless. You know, that's a really good question. And I haven't, uh, done much winter camping, so I haven't looked into it. Um, but, uh, so I, I won't officially comment on it, but I would guess that as long as you're like way past the, uh, hibernation time and far away from, you know, when they're going to come out of hibernation, uh, that you'd probably be a little bit more, less concerned with the bears. Um, but that'd be a good question for uh, some winter camping experts. I'm thinking of Dave and Amy Freeman, especially uh, with their year in the Boundary Waters. I'm sure that they <laughs> would have some good insight for that. So I'll shoot them a message and see what yes. they say. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, a great idea. Um, um, scrolling through, it looks like we've still got a lot of questions here. I'm seeing nice. um, Barry was wondering what specifically you would do differently now to avoid the bear encounter that you had? Um, and then also, do you think being on such a long trip made you let down your guard? Those are very good questions. So um, I'll start with what I would do differently. So I talked about a couple of these. Um, I did not announce my presence when I was coming up over a blind ridge. Um, so now I would clap or sing or make a show of myself. Um, so that they know that I'm there. And that's these are all things that I do <laughs> when I'm in grizzly country now as well. Um, I would avoid being by myself. Statistics drop significantly uh, when there's three or more people. Um, I would have bear spray on my person and ready to go. And that's something that you can kind of like drill yourself with, um, you know, getting it out and pulling the lever. And they actually make training cans so you can do like the full press without giving yourself a... <laughs> lung full of uh bear spray which is awful um so those are some of the big ones you know announcing your presence there being more than one person and then having the bear spray so uh that's on the avoid side of things and again i think that's some of the most important uh stuff to take away is how is it what do, what do you do to avoid an attack um, and then for the actual attack itself, you know, I kind of hem and ha on what I would have done differently or not. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I could have played dead. Uh, and there's uh, people have done that successfully. Um, people have also done that and sustained injuries uh, like I sustained. So, you know, uh, 601, half dozen the other. Um, so, yeah, but putting uh, those practices into place to avoid it in the first place are really, really critical. And then the other part of the question, uh, remind me of the second part. Um, let's see. Someone was wondering, yeah, do you think that being on such a long trip That's had right. made you let your guard down? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think there is a certain comfort that comes with being in an area and uh, things going well. You know, you get, you get used to it and then you get... Uh, you get checked pretty hard sometimes and sometimes it's you know a life-changing check like in my situation um i think i don't know if i let my guard down i th i think that the practices that we as a group had um you know i would go back there and, and do things a little bit differently like i was just mentioning so you know regardless of the density of bears and we were like I said, working in an area that had very dispersed population. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, oh, it's so unlikely. So 
you don't need to have that with you. Um, I think that mindset is, is, uh, a little bit dangerous. Well, of course it is. Um, so, you know, anytime that I'm in grizzly country now, I, I have those practices in place and again, you know, coming back to own what you can and then, and then enjoy the rest. Um, if you put those into place, then you know that you're doing that the best that you can and, um, preparing yourself for success. So, then you can just enjoy it. Great. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all of that about, about your personal experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I see that some people had some more questions about the bear spray itself. Um, mm -hmm. Al was asking, do you know what the ingredients of bear spray are that are noxious to bears? Is it just pepper spray basically, or is it something else? Well, <laughs> I happen to have a can. <laughs> um, so the active ingredients are capsaicin and related capsaicinoids with an asterisk and then other ingredients. So yeah, it's basically a pepper spray, um, but it is specific to bears. Um, I like to carry the counter assault ones. Some people talk about um, using like dog spray um, or different ones. But uh, what I like about these these bigger cans is they are dispersed and they just kind of go out there and they make a fog. Um, if it's like a stream, then you have to be very uh, accurate. And when you're dealing with a bear encounter, there's a lot of adrenaline going and it's a very intense um, situation and you want to simplify things as much as possible. So with this one, I mean, you can hold it with one finger and it dangles in a pretty accurate um way and then you just slide the safety lever off and squeeze so the simplicity of operation works really well um for that and you just you have to think about which way which way the wind is blowing really <laughs> you don't so, want to spray yourself too much accidentally <laughs> yeah exactly i mean it'll it's it's not a fun experience to breathe it in <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody else wanted to hear about the long-term storage of bear spray that they've heard you should shake it every six months and then wondering if it is if it freezes if that is an issue those are all very good questions um and i would defer to the manufacturer for uh their suggestions there is an expiration on all these um i can't find it on this one so you know just like with any safety um any safety material you want to make sure that you're bringing stuff that's going to work when you need it to um you know there's nothing worse than going and nothing happens or doing your air horn and it just squeaks <laughs> yeah i think uh natalie warren in her um without giving away too much in, in her book hudson bay bound she talks about a bear encounter that they had and um their air horn was left a little bit to be desired uh so <laughs> test your equipment um and then with with uh you know bear spray you might not necessarily want to be um actually spraying it but um you know stick within the manufacturer guidelines for sure and you mentioned Hudson Bay Bound, and we did we did a presentation with Natalie Warren a couple months ago. So for awesome. anyone that's interested, we do have like a, a recording of that on our website, just where Natalie is kind of talking about her experience and her adventure canoeing to Hudson Bay. Um, so that'll be on our YouTube page as well. Um, I just want to be mindful that we're getting up towards the end of the hour here. Um, maybe I'll end with one more question or so. Um, somebody wanted to know if there are geo maps or other ways to that show bear populations, other ways to kind of get an idea of where bears might be. That's a really good question. I haven't looked for that specifically. There's a lot of really robust and valuable map resources out there. And I think, uh, Maya, didn't the Friends just launch a Boundary Waters mapping um, aspect to the website? Yeah, so we have a route planning tool, and I'm, I guess I'm not sure how much we have on bears there. but Yeah, and the other ones I've looked at um, haven't, uh, I don't think they've included bears, but there was information like uh, burn area 
and um including like the dates that it happened and the whole scope which is pretty cool um so i'm sure that the forest service has some sort of gis data and that's another important thing to note if you do have a bear encounter especially if you have a, any sort of negative bear encounter you should report that to the forest service when you come out of your trip um you know, you don't have to beeline it out to, to file the report, um, you know, unless there's another reason for you to get out of the woods. But they do want that data. Uh, it will help other campers to, um, you know, if they need to change any regulations or anything like that, they want to track it. So share that, share that with uh, your outfitter or with the, with the rangers on your departure. Really, that's really helpful. Um, I just put um, a link to in the chat that has Alex's blog on our website. And then this next link is our trip planning feature that, that you brought up. Um, it has some of those maps as well. Um, so for anyone that is interested in that, um, I wanna close out just with a comment that somebody had. I'm just trying to find it on here. Someone just saying that uh, coincidentally, I just finished your book recently and really enjoyed it and want to recommend it to everybody and glad that you're here to tell your story. So oh. I think that um, is a great place to end this. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining today, for um, Alex, for all of your insight and for answering questions and all of that. Um, just a reminder to everybody that we will have a recording of this that I can send out along with some of these links that we've brought up. Um, Alex, any, any final thoughts um, before we close it out here? Oh, I think you did a really great job. Thank you to that reader for sharing that and for reading the story. Um, I really appreciate uh, your kind words. And I hope that uh, if other folks pick it up, you enjoy it. Um, but I think I just want to close with uh, thanking you, Maya, and thanking the Friends of the Boundary Waters again for hosting this, but um, for being advocates of the Boundary Waters and this amazing resource and place that um, all of us enjoy so much. So uh, it was really a really fun opportunity to partner with you on this. And um, I hope people just have amazing trips when they go out. Great. Well, yeah, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. I encourage folks to check out our website. Um, we've got a lot of great resources on there. Um, donate to the friends if you are able to help us keep going with this work um, or check out some of our other upcoming events. I did just put my email in the chat as well um, if people wanna reach out to me afterwards. Um, so yeah, thanks again, everybody. I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Alex. Bye-bye. Thanks, Maya. Thanks, everybody.